Public Accounts Committee on Thursday, the 13th of May 2021. We're here today to question Mr. David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, uh, about his interactions uh, with uh, Greensill Capital, but particularly uh, around our area of focus, uh, which is about how Greensill Capital's access to government uh, may have contributed to some policy decisions by government uh, in terms of handling uh, corporate relations. Um, and I just would say that we um, have listened to the Treasury Select Committee's uh, earlier hearing, and so Mr Cameron won't need to answer any of those uh, points, and he can refer to those former answers where that's appropriate, that we may still probe, and also to flag that our sister committee, the uh, Constitutional Affairs uh, Committee, um, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, to give it its full title, is also conducting a wider inquiry about the issue of lobbying, so that is also not really our main focus today. Um, so, Mr Cameron, we're hoping we can dispatch this within an hour or so um, with your support in, in swift answers where that's appropriate, um, and uh, we, I will hurry things along as necessary, but we do need the time to ask the questions and you need to have the time to answer them so we do appreciate uh, that that might not quite run exactly to timetable. So without further ado I'm going to pass to the Deputy Chair of the Committee Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown to kick off. Over to you Sir Geoffrey. Thank you Chair. Good afternoon David. Um, you've had a long session with the Treasury so we're going to keep this fairly short and brief. When in your time in office when did you first become aware of the possible use of supply finance uh, to in the public sector? Well, um, Lex Greensill was employed um, by, I mean, I think Jeremy Haywood uh, was responsible for bringing him into government, I think in 2011. Uh, I don't think I met him till 2012, by which time he had worked up uh, one initiative, which was two things. It was a mixture of private sector companies that were going to use supply chain finance to ease credit conditions for their suppliers, to help with the credit crunch, which I was all in favor of. And there was this one government scheme uh, to enable NHS ph ph pharmacies to be paid more quickly by um, uh, uh, under supply chain finance rather than by the NHS. So I announced that um, package in October 2012. I don't think I had any other engagement with the issue while I was in office, but my understanding is that other such uh, schemes and ideas were looked at, but none came to fruition. So I had a relatively limited experience with it, but in terms of the one issue that came forward, I think it was some, um, I would describe it as beneficial. But, but, but Lex, Hill, Lex Greenshill didn't suddenly arrive in number 10. Somebody must have briefed you at some stage on supply uh, uh, chain finance. Who was that and when was it? Well, I, I, sus I would suspect it would be Jeremy Haywood and I would have been informed at some stage that this appointment was being made. Um, I don't think I played any part in um, the run-up to the appointment, um, but all the, as I understand, the Cabinet Office papers are being looked at and the Nigel Borman inquiry will be looking at this, but I'm sure I would have been informed um, that he was coming in to look at this issue. Um, and uh, as I say, then my interaction with him was really around 2012. So you were asked in the Treasury Select Committee what its use was, what, what its advantage was it in the public sector, given that there is a public contract regulations, and given that government on a departmental basis pays most of its bills in the high 90% in 30 days and uh, the high 70s in five days, what is the necessity or what is the advantage of supply chain finance in the public sector? I think there are um, two or three important points to make about why it has an application and I think the NHS pharmacy scheme is a, is a good example and you, you would have heard of the Treasury Select Committee figures being quoted for it saving the NHS £100 million a year because uh, they're not having to reimburse the cost of capital of NHS pharmacies and also pharmacies themselves saying how much they liked having the early cash because it eased their cash flow and meant that they weren't having to borrow so much from, from banks. So I would say in looking at the public sector, a couple of points. The first thing is, although public bodies say they want to pay their bills early and huge progress has been made and a lot of credit needs to go to those organisations, there is in some public bodies just a level of bureaucracy and paperwork that's involved in generating invoices and paying bills 
that means there is a delay and the NHS uh, would be a good example of that. And so using an outside provider who can pay the pharmacies or other small businesses immediately and then reclaim the money from the government, uh, there's an advantage in doing that because instead of being five days, it can be effectively one day. That's point one. Second point is you can use, as we did with NHS pharmacies, actually go one better than um, paying as soon as an invoice is generated. You can predict what NHS pharmacies are going to be prescribing and pay them in advance. And that's what's happened with the NHS pharmacy scheme. So that's point number two. Point number three is, I think, complicated but important. In his evidence to the Treasury Select Committee, Nick McPherson said, yes, of course, the Treasury is in favour of early payment, but do remember that early payment does mean the Treasury having to produce more cash, borrow more money, and therefore pay an interest charge on it. So there's a cost to the Treasury. And I think the point that um, Mr Greensill made in the committee, which I'd repeat, is, of course, if you use an outside supplier of that finance and you pay your suppliers early, Remember, you're paying them early, but with a discount, they are effectively paying for that early payment rather than the Treasury. So I think those three reasons are good reasons for considering that this is not some sort of um, bizarre uh, idea, but actually has a real world application. So if it's so desirable, why did any one major scheme get off the ground in your time? That is a very good question, and I don't know the answer to it. I think uh, it would be necessary to ask either Mr Greensill, who was working in the government at the time, or perhaps some of the Cabinet Office folk who were working with Jeremy Haywood, um, who very sadly is no longer with us. I think lots of other applications were looked at, um, but the, the, the NHS pharmacy one was a sort of, you know, a really straightforward, not straightforward, but a, a, a really good one because the benefit was going to these effectively small businesses. Um, but I, I can't really answer that question. Isn't the real answer that the Treasury were always uh, pessimistic, even opposed to supply chain finance for the very reasons that you've already laid out, that they've got to pay out the money and pay the interest? Well, I think they no. Well, of course, if you're using supply chain finance, the Treasury aren't paying out the money. That's the whole point. When you use supply chain finance, so for instance, at the moment, the NHS pharmacies are being paid by, well, it was the case before the company went under, they were being paid immediately by Greensill. And the government, the NHS, was paying Greensill back after 30 or 60 days. So it wasn't Treasury money. I think the reluctance in the Treasury sort of relates to two points, which are both important points. One is, as Nick McPherson said, if you do pay very early, um, that means you're borrowing more money and paying an interest charge on it. That's the government paying early. Um, I think that's the first point. And the second point is they are, I think, um, uh, nervous about using an outside supplier because, of course, the government's cost of money is lower than anybody else's. Exactly. Um, but, of course, the government's cost of money is not always transferred from the Treasury to individual departments. Individual departments' cost of money is a weighted cost rather than necessarily the government cost. So I, I think there is merit in looking at these schemes. They're not, I mean, some people have said it's all totally pointless. I don't accept that. You know, I would say listen to what the pharmacists say. They've, they've enjoyed this scheme and, and had merit from it. Thank you very much, Sir Jeffrey. Um, Barry Gardner, MP. Thank you, Chair. Um, when you were Prime Minister, Mr Cameron, Lex Greensill had access to you as an unpaid advisor. Can you just set out how that came about? Because apparently there's no documentation of his role at number 10 and the public might think it incredible that a guy can have a desk in the cabinet office with no salary and yet be off the official radar. Um, I assume he must have had a pass and security clearance. How did it all come about? Well, my understanding um, is that um, Mr. Greensill was brought in by Jeremy Haywood, who had known him from a previous job. Jeremy, I think, had all great intentions. He was an outstanding civil servant. He was conscious of the fact that the, the civil service can benefit from outside advice and input. And my understanding is he brought him in with this remit of looking at 
how government can do better at paying bills faster, particularly in small businesses, and whether there was an application for this uh, approach. And he had an office in the cabinet office. I, I'm sure I was informed he was coming and would have said, yes, let's have outside experts. But I, I haven't yet seen a paper trail um, for that. But my understanding, he was uh, given an office, given a pass, uh, brought in by Jeremy, and would have been reporting in some way through the cabinet office. Well, uh, uh, as you said to the Treasury Select Committee, um, Sir Jeremy, a, a, an amazingly fine civil servant, um, is no longer here to explain and defend himself. But um, when Mr. Greensill accompanied you to a Federation Small Business Conference, you gave him what I think is known as a shout out, saying, Lex, where are you? Give us a wave. And you told the audience, Lex is sorting out the whole supply chain issue for us. So you clearly knew him quite well by that stage. That's 2014, three years on. But you'll recall um, Liam Fox's resignation letter to you over his unpaid friend and advisor, Adam Werity. In that letter, he said that he had mistakenly allowed his personal and professional responsibilities to become blurred. Do you think that perhaps the same happened with you and Lex Greenson? No, not at all, because um, my recollection is that between 2011, when Lex Greenson arrived in government, and between the time I stopped being Prime Minister, I'm pretty certain I met him no more than twice. Um, and I think the two times were when we met to discuss um, the announcement in October 2012 of the initiative that I just spoke to Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown about. And I think the second meeting was when we went to this Federation of Small Business um, speech. Um, I remember thinking that the supply chain finance initiative was a good one and I remember the event in Downing Street where there were lots of UK corporates who had agreed to, to use this approach and I liked it because we were in a credit crunch at the time, the bank weren't lending in a way that we wanted them to and this was a way of extending credit to small businesses because effectively they were using, um, if it was Vodafone, they were using Vodafone's ability to borrow money to borrow money themselves to put it Simply. Yes, so, so I think the shout out, if indeed there was one, and I've been told about it, so it must be true, the shout out was because I thought this was a good initiative and I remembered announcing it. But I don't think otherwise I had any interaction with Lex Greensill um, at all. So, he so that was just your natural bonhomie in, in a crowd? Well, I, I, I like to think so, but I don't actually recall it, but I've been told about it, so I'm sure it's true. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner. Uh, uh, Mr. Peter Grant, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Cameron. Can I move on to your decision a few years after you left office to go and work with Greensill Capital? What was it that attracted you to work for them rather than presumably one of a number of organisations that might be quite keen to recruit you? Um, well, I um, met up with Mr. Greensill after I left office and he told me about the business that he had created and was growing um, and I was looking at a number of as I said in the Treasury Select Committee I had some pro bono charitable work with Alzheimer's and dementia and fragile states I wanted to do some business uh, interests as well um, I took quite a long time to make up my mind but what I thought was interesting about Greensill was this core product of going to big businesses and saying, let us pay your supply chains immediately, and then you pay us after 60 or 90 days. And in the meantime, we raise the money on the capital markets. What I liked about that was it was helping small businesses with cash flow, which is a key concern. So to me, it was like many of these things that are happening in our economy, taking one thing that, a, that banks have done, not always done very well, and trying to make it better, cheaper, faster, digital, paperless, and all the rest of it. So it was, if you like, a sort of um, a, a UK fintech potential success story. That is what I thought was interesting. Um, I thought about it very hard before joining. Um, I did some due diligence, I explained to the Treasury Select Committee, but obviously I'm very sad this you know, company ultimately failed. But that was 
what I was thinking. I, I was interested in, as Prime Minister, I tried to promote FinTech and make sure we were a FinTech leader. Here was a FinTech success story, and I, I thought it would be interesting to get involved. Was your decision influenced to any significant extent by the dealings that the government had had with Mr. Cainsell previously, or was it entirely the conversations he had after he had left office that well, made up your mind? Very good question. Just to be absolutely clear, there was no conversation while I was in office with Mr. Greensill about potentially working for him. As I said, that I met him twice and that was never raised with me. When he did come to see me after I left office and talked about his business and then uh, talked about me potentially being an advisor, uh, the fact that I had um, you know, announced something in government and had taken up this technology and, and pushed for it, that did I uh, have a bearing on, on my understanding of what he was trying to do. It meant that I wasn't coming to this whole idea cold. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was a, a point of shared interest, if you like. He said, you seem to warm to and understand what this industry is about when you were Prime Minister. And, of course, I had the recollection of the announcement we made and what I thought had been a positive effect. But there was no other connection, as it were, between the two events. Thank you. And looking at it from the other side, apart from the fact that you were a recent former Prime Minister, what do you think they saw in you that made you a better pick than a number of other people who could have approached? Um, well, that's really a question for them rather than me. I think that um, you know, as a company that was small but growing, that was competing with big banks, uh, that wanted to expand internationally, that wanted to win over new clients. Um, I think that was the attraction, was having someone who would roll up their sleeves and help expansion in China or India, help win clients in Australia or America. It was very much about that. Um, the public sector side of the work um, was very much later. When I joined, it was really focused on winning these big corporate customers, and I think they thought I would bring um, some uh, enthusiasm and ability to that, but it would be better to ask him, really. Thank you. In your evidence earlier to the Treasury Select Committee, um, you said that you weren't employed as a lobbyist, you employed in a different role, Bob Greensill, um, but at some point you effectively became a lobbyist, making representations direct to UK government ministers and others. Who was it initiated the process by which you became a lobbyist within the UK system as opposed to the role that you'd originally been appointed to? I think there were, there were two developments. The first was the um, potential economic crisis following from COVID, um, where suddenly the issue of how lending and credit could be supported became a very live issue and an important issue for Greensill because we were funding a lot of companies' supply chains. I can't remember exactly how the conversation came about, but um, it, it was, I think, really that we saw the Bank of England talk about helping to finance supply chains. We saw this scheme, the CCFF, come about, and Greensill thought, well, we have a great idea for improving it. And so uh, the need was to try and get that in front of government. And I think that's where I became involved. The second development was, um, it was in thinking about how to pay suppliers early and why it was a good thing, it was an obvious leap to say, well, the most important supplier for any business is the workforce. And if you can use technology um, through companies' ERP systems to pay their suppliers early, why can't you use the same technology to enable um, workers for that company to draw down their salary as they earn it rather than wait till the end of the month? And I thought that was a fantastically exciting development. And Greensill decided that you know, in the NHS, for instance, and in the public sector, this should be done for free, for free to employer and employee. And why that was so important is you know, any of these schemes that allow salary advance um, to companies, if you charge the employee even a small amount, it's still a big APR, it's still a big interest charge. So this was always free to the employee, which attracted me a lot, but free to the employer as well. Uh, I thought it was a tremendous give back to the NHS and public sector workers, and I was very keen to talk about that. And so there's no secret about that. I became a, a, a 
you know, a, a, a big explainer and um, a big enthusiast for it. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. I'd a little bit seen that with respect, you didn't actually answer the specific question, which was not about the circumstances that made it appropriate for Green Silver to be contacted the government. But who was it that decided that you would be the person to contact the government? On well, I, 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 Did you suggest saying, that to them? Did they suggest it to you? Or is it something you can't remember how it came about? I can't remember exactly. I expect it came out of a conversation between between me and Mr. Greensill about how to try and, um, you know, make this government scheme work better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much Mr. Mr. Grant. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Sir Bernard Jenkin, MP. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the, 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 this committee is concerned not about the lobbying inquiry that PACAC will be doing. We're concerned about value for money. But the revolving door question is of concern because um, it perhaps compromises the value for money which people in public office uh, might be able to obtain because they're thinking in the future about what jobs they might get. Now you've made very clear, Mr Cameron, that that wasn't in your mind at all and I perfectly accept that. But I think what we have to ask is uh, what message do you think uh, your appointment by Mr Greensill after you left government and you went through all the proper procedures and it was all within the rules. But what message does that send to officials and even ministers who might have been dealing with Mr Greensill at the time about their future employment prospects uh, if they were nice to Mr Greensill, Greensill from their public office? Do you understand the concern that this raises? I, I, I do understand um, the concern. I think all I would say is, um, you know, there, there's a appointments process. I said to the Treasury Committee about how we can improve it, make it more mandatory, make it compulsory, uh, make it enforceable, maybe change the, the rules and, and make them stronger. But I think that it would be odd if you, you know, you could, you know, after you leave office, you, it, it's perfectly acceptable to take up some commercial roles. Um, there was a gap in terms of this one. There was very little connection between me and Mr. Greensill when I was in government. So it wasn't for me um, a particularly live um, consideration because I thought, okay, I made one announcement about supply chain finance as the Prime Minister. Now I'm going to go and work with this company. It wasn't as if there was some deep connection. No, um, I, 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 I don't think that's, that's I'm, I'm not making that accusation at all. Um, but. I think we need to ask ourselves um, um, how appropriate it is for uh, people who have had dealings with a particular business while they were in office being subsequently employed by that business. Not because the, there is definitely anything bad ha to have happened, but because of the relationship it complicates um, in terms of the people. That. I I think it's it's very difficult with this because it is. You know, I'm sure you would agree. We do want an interchange of people coming out of the private sector and into the public sector, and people going from the public sector into the private sector. And if you, off the top of my head, you think of someone who's worked in the treasury, um, in the finance area, would that preclude them from, you know, when they leave after ten years or twenty years or thirty years, going to work with a bank? So we have to sort of. I, I can see the principle. What you're saying, we have to think of the real world um, examples, and then this general question of I mean, I'm in favor of interchange between public and private sectors, and so you have to be careful that what you do doesn't make it impossible. Does that I, make sense? I, I agree with that. And uh, we produced a report while you were in office from the Public Administration Select Committee, which addressed all this and raised all these concerns. I'm afraid. Um, it wasn't you personally, but the, your government rejected all our recommendations. And now the chair of ACABA is suggesting it, it should be put onto statutory footing. There should be a much more formal process because there is so much more interchange between business and government. Um, and I hope when you appear in front of PACAC uh, that you'll read that report and the subsequent report that the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee did in 2017, I'd say a rather better report. Um, and that you will consider these issues before you appear in front of that committee, and I'll leave it there on that point.
I'll bring you back later, Sir Jeffrey. Uh, Sir Ben, sorry, not <laughs> to Sir Jeffrey Clifton Brown. Um, Mr. Cameron, you attended the uh, launch of the pharmacy early payment scheme in 2012, two years after Lex Greenhill had come into number 10. Uh, at what point did you become involved with that scheme? Was it the normal sort of prime ministerial briefing just before the launch, or had you been involved at an earlier stage of its design? I, I don't have the paperwork, but my, my guess would be that this initiative was worked up, uh, it would have gone into my box, and I would have agreed it and agreed to the announcement probably at the same time. That would be um, what I think would, would happen. Um, and as I say, I was, thought it was a, a good piece of work and, and broadly speaking still do. So you were uh, well briefed on the scheme before you went to the launch in 2012. There was another four years at least uh, after you, while well, you were still Prime Minister. Given that you've waxed lyrical, both the Treasury Select Committee and this committee, on the benefits of the scheme, why were there no other schemes? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, you were I Prime Minister. You were Prime Minister. Well, but supply chain finance was a, a, you know, it's a relatively niche area um, in life, and for a Prime Minister it's uh, very niche. Um, uh, and as I say, I was more interested, frankly, at that stage in the private sector commercial part of it because the pressure in government, if you remember at the time, was, you know, the economy was beginning to restart, but the banks weren't lending. And so credit, there was the credit crunch. And so ideas that could get capital into private sector firms so they could create jobs were, were at a premium. That's why I was so keen on the scheme. So. But I'm sorry to give an unsatisfactory answer. Um, I think it would be better to ask the Cabinet Office, the Treasury, and perhaps Mr. Greenson himself, what got st what, why did these other schemes get stuck? Were there no other applications? Which things did you look at? Um, and uh, I think that is a very worthwhile question, but I don't personally have the answer, I'm afraid. You just said that it was a very niche idea. I'm still slightly curious why Lex Greenhill was given an office in number 10 rather than somewhere in the Treasury or Cabinet Office or somewhere. What was it? Why did he need to come into number 10 if it was such a I, niche idea? I think he was in the Cabinet Office, not in number 10. Um, yeah. I think that um, uh, I think it was the, the Cabinet Office. It's niche, but as I said, in the private sector part of it, if you, you know, we were spending a lot of time trying to get uh, funding for lending, trying to get loan guarantee schemes going, trying, we had the, I think it was called the Merlin Agreement with the banks, which was all about trying to get the banks to commit to a certain amount of small business lending. And here was this idea that seemed to extend credit to small businesses in a different way. So that was the bit I was enthusiastic about. But I'm sorry to give an unsatisfactory answer on the, on the other part. So, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Cameron. I wanted to ask, back in 2011-2012, was there a specific problem with getting payments to pharmacies that you were aware of? Well, I think that there was a problem in that they got their payments um, quite late because of the bureaucracy. And I think if you look at what happened since, um, I think it is, I mean, I, I think it is a success story. The figures I've seen. Is that sorry, Mr. Cameron, can I just they, ask? Can I just ask? Sorry, were you were aw were you aware that pharmacies were getting paid? That a large number of pharmacies were getting paid late as a result of bureaucracy. Um, I don't think it was something I would previously have been aware of. But when I saw, and I have to be careful here because it was a long time ago. But having examined what this proposal has done, I can see that it's been a success. And I can give you, if you like, examples of pharmacies who have whacked an about it. So um, can, can I ask, though, Mr Cameron, sorry to interrupt you again, so would you say that this scheme was introduced because the solution existed rather than the problem existed? I think both. And there wouldn't be a solution if there wasn't a problem. Um, I mean, as I said, I think to the Treasury Select Committee, there was one pharmacy told Greenson at the time that annual charges had gone down from £7,000 a year to £400 a year. Um, and a lot of, you know, uh, you know, a lot of extra cash was given to pharmacies more quickly. So I think it was both a problem and a solution. 
So, but uh, just referring to your earlier answer when you referred to the, the, the pharmacy scheme at the, at the beginning of the session, you were saying that uh, it costs money for the Treasury to borrow the money required to make prompt payments. Is it not true that through this scheme you're actually asking these community pharmacies, these small businesses in our town centres, to bear those costs rather than the Treasury having to bear those costs, even though it must be considerably cheaper for the Treasury to do it? Well, of course, proper, the supply chain finance works on the basis that pharmacies get the money up front but at a discount, so i.e. they're getting less than the full amount but they're getting it early. So yes, they are paying for it, but when you look at what pharmacies pay for banking and for credit and for bank loans and all the rest of it, it's far cheaper, and that's why it was a success with pharmacies. The point I was making about the Treasury was that um, one of the reasons the Treasury has been quite resistant to even prompter payment is, as Nick McPherson explained to the Treasury Select Committee, even prompter payment does have costs for the Treasury. But the costs for the Treasury are presumably cheaper than the costs for the pharmacy, the pharmacies of uh, the discount that they had to, they had to take in order to uh, take advantage of this scheme. Yes, this is where it gets very complicated. You, you're, if, in an ideal world, the Treasury advanced the money as the supply chain finance provider does immediately to the pharmacy with no delay, that would probably be cheaper all round. So we ask ourselves the question, why doesn't that happen? And the answer is A, bureaucracy, and the answer is B, the Treasury doesn't like bearing even that cost. And that is why uh, this solution is a good workaround from that problem. And one of the reasons why it's worth thinking about is, of course, a lot of government payment is not to small businesses like pharmacies, it's to very big suppliers. And I think it's a good point to make that, of course, if the Treasury pays the really big suppliers early, it is incurring a cost because it's having to borrow the money, whereas if a supply chain finance provider pays the big suppliers, um, the big suppliers are effectively paying a little bit for the benefit of getting the money early. I hope that makes sense. But, but in, your, in your... In your... find a way through this sort of um, thicket, it's important to understand those dynamics. In your earlier evidence, though, Mr Cameron, you said that this, this scheme was of benefit to small community pharmacies, and now you're saying that actually it, it, it's good because the bigger chains are having to pay a greater share of the costs rather than the Treasury. Do, can you it. identify who, who's, who's the real beneficiary here? Who actually was the real beneficiary of this, uh, of this particular scheme? The, beneficiaries, the beneficiary of the NHS pharmacy scheme was really twofold. First is pharmacies, who are small businesses, worried about cash flow, worried about working capital, they were getting their money minus a discount up front, which was good for them. Uh, I can give you the percentage of the number of pharmacies that took part, and I can also give you their testimony about why they liked it. So that's beneficiary number one. Beneficiary number two was the government, because the government, via the NHS, was reimbursing pharmacies, in some cases, for their cost of capital, and that was an extra expense. Uh, and so I think there was a saving to the government of £100 million pounds a year. Saving to the taxpayer. Um, yes. can, you, um, can you tell me, were you aware of any conflicts of interest in rolling up the scheme? I wasn't aware of any uh, conflicts of interest. My understanding is what happened, um, uh, but I've sort of pieced this together from some of the press reports and what I've had to find out subsequently, is what happened was Lex Greensill came into government, worked on supply chain finance, and this particular scheme was put in place by Citibank, who he had used to work for but no longer worked for, and the reason for that is I think Citibank were the government's payment agent. What then happens is Mr. Greensill leaves government and in a competitive tender, Greensill um, wins the contract off Citibank to provide this service. I think that was in July 2018, before I joined um, the company. So I think in terms of conflicts, I mean, you'd have to ask him, but I think he would argue that he wasn't conflicted when in government because it was run by the government's existing payment agent. Is that what you're getting at? 
It, do you not think it was slightly uh, useful for him while he was in government to be able to implement a scheme that his uh, own company was, was well placed to provide the finance for at a later date? Well, I, I, you know, there was a press article about this that said, um, you know, Elect Green Silk introduced a scheme from which he directly benefited. Uh, and I thought that was um, not really accurate because, of course, his firm didn't take over this contract um, for a further six years, and it did so in a competitive tender. I thought it was a bit like saying, um, I benefited from arranging your marriage six years ago because six years later I married your ex-partner. I mean, it, it seemed to me that was an unfair um, argument. Okay, I think I understand. <laughs> um, when you first heard about the scheme, um, were you, did, you, did you encourage civil servants to particularly push it forward and to, uh, to, to, uh, to implement it? Well, I, I think, again, I, I, I may need the Baldwin inquiry to show me all the paperwork of what I received and when as Prime Minister. So this is sort of educated guesswork. I think what I would have got is a note in my box saying, here is what the team have been working on, the supply chain finance, and the two elements of it I described. And I would sign that off and agree with the announcement at the same time. That is my guess about what happened. I'm hoping that the Baldwin Inquiry will be able to sort of give me access to the papers, so if I've got anything wrong there, I can come back to you. OK, thank you very much, Ms. Olney. Uh, Richard Holden, MP, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Mr Cameron, why not just sort out the bureaucracy if there was a bureaucratic element within the NHS? You know, surely that would be the most sensible thing to have done rather than to bring in a different system. Well, of course, um, it, it, in many ways, that would be a sensible suggestion. But I think there are, as I said, there are two sort of barriers here. One is the barrier of bureaucracy, which is, and it's not just the pharmacy payment. I think if you talk to businesses that interact with the NHS, they'll tell you that you know there is quite a lot of bureaucracy, understandably, because we're talking about public money, so people are nervous about signing off invoices too quickly and all the rest of it. So the first point is bureaucracy, and the second point is, as Nick McPherson, I thought, put it very well in the Treasury, <coughs> evidence of the Treasury Select Committee, um, there can be some resistance in the Treasury because early payment does have a cost to them. And then I'll add this third element, which is, of course, in the case of the NHS pharmacies, they weren't just being paid early, they were being paid before drugs were dispensed on the basis of um, being able to predict via an algorithm what their prescription history was. So that's something that, that's a risk that perhaps government wouldn't want to take. So I think for those three reasons, it is worth at least considering this. Um, uh, just on that point though, I mean, obviously early payments would have a cost, but um, uh, you know, it's a pretty small cost for the uh, Treasury given the cost of borrowing for uh, government. Surely the, the bigger cost would be the fact that the um, pharmacies would have to factor in the fact they're going to get less money. So therefore they charge more or push for a higher price of their product in order to rebalance that. So the real, so the, there's actually the real cost is to the taxpayer at the end of the day anyway. Well, I don't, I mean, I'm not the world's living expert on this, but I don't think that's correct for, for this reason, that um, if you're a pharmacy, uh, like any small business, one of your biggest concerns is working capital and cash. And of course, if you haven't got a good working capital solution, then you have to go to the bank and borrow money. And that is going to be more expensive than the cash, less the discount that you're getting from the supply chain finance. But that is, I think, one of the key points to this whole argument. If you're a business, there are various sources of finance to you. You can sell equity, you can raise debt, you can borrow money from the bank, or you can have working capital arrangements that give you cheap capital. And that, I think, is, is for a small business, that is what is so powerful. But it just, it, 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 you do understand the, the issue here, uh, Mr Cameron, because obviously the solution that was, was come up with, rather than just sorting out the bureaucracy, which would seem to be particularly, you could have targeted it just at the small community pharmacies who have exactly these cash flow issues. The, the solution you came up with was via Green Soil Capital, uh, and a company you then went on to work for. Well, initially, this was provided by Citibank, um, as I said, Indeed. the government's paying the agency. 
pay 80 and Greensill won the contract, as I understand it, in 2018, six years after it was introduced in a fully competitive tender because they were offering to provide the finance at a lower cost. Look, I, I, I think that in this early payment space, you should look at all the options. Can you get rid of the office? Can you make government departments pay faster? Can you perhaps change the way the Treasury worked to enable um, departments to access Treasury style cost of capital rather than their own? These are all interesting arguments, but all I'm saying is if you have something that works, and I think this early payment scheme in the pharmacies has worked, um, it is worth uh, thinking about how, how, to, how to keep something like that going and possibly extend it. And so, just one final question, but do you accept that there would also be potential knock on costs? To the, uh, to the taxpayer because pharmacies would obviously want to get 100% of the cash um, so they would just pump up their prices down the line. Well, the way it worked was that, um, as I say, there was a benefit to the taxpayer because instead of the NHS having to reimburse pharmacies for their cost of capital, uh, the pharmacies were getting less than 100% of the cash but getting it up front. So they were benefiting and the taxpayer was benefiting at the same time. So it was... Um, without wanting to sound like a Chinese politician, a win-win situation. All right, thank you. Well, can I just, um, before I bring in Sir Bernard again, um, in uh, disclosures to the Treasury Select Committee, Mr Cameron, the Treasury says, and I quote, that the scheme would allow participating pharmacies to access funding earlier than standard government payment schedule, but after services had been delivered. You said um, in your answers that it would give, it gave money before services have been delivered. Can you just be, it, there seems to be a contradiction yes. there. Again, I think this is a question for Greensill Capital rather than me, but my understanding is this scheme was improved from being one where pharmacy dispenses drug, pharmacy then immediately gets the money from the supply chain finance provider. That was phase one, rather than waiting the 30 days for the NHS to reimburse. It moved to a system where via an algorithm that predicted the dispensing behaviour of the pharmacy, it gave the money in advance of the drug being prescribed. Why that was able to work is pharmacies um, are quite predictable. No, I think that, 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 that's, that, that, that's fine. That's given just explained enough for now. We'll be looking further into this uh, uh, if necessary as a committee. So I'm going to go now to uh, Sir Bernard Jenkin. Over to you, Sir Bernard. Um, it may be that um, this um, pharmacy scheme was... Um, as you describe it, um, um, a really positive benefit to the NHS and to the pharma to pharmacy sector. And it's unfortunate, therefore, that it's become um, tainted by um, yeah. what has happened and the sense that there has been a failure to manage uh, conflicts of interest, which um, uh, undermines public confidence in imaginative um, and good things. Um, uh, so I just want to ask about the influence and transparency and the role of and the accountability for Crown representatives, which were um, a, an office that was created um, under your government uh, by Francis Maud, I think was the was the champion. And I, I rather supported these, these, this role. I thought it was a very good way of um, employing much more commercial, accelerating the commercial um, capability of the civil service and improving contracting. Um, and I was scrutinising it as chair of, of, of PASC at the time. But I am now concerned that um, they seem to have been outside the usual system of public appointments, because public appointments are usually covered by the Public Appointments Commission. Uh, so who actually appoints Crown representatives? I'm afraid I'm not an um, expert on this. I, I, like you, like the idea of this, bringing in commercial people to help government with procurement and procurement decisions seems to be a good idea. If you remember the context for this, it was when we came in in 2010, there was a sense that there was a lot of waste in government procurement, and that's what these Crown representatives were there to help with. And I think, by and large, it's successful. But I, I'm, the appointment terms and the terms of office, I, it's not my area of expertise. But I mean, um, what was the process by which the policy to have Crown representatives was was approved in government? Were you, did it come to cabinet? I would have to go back and check the paperwork on that. Um, as you say, I think this was a Francis Maud initiative, but I'd have to check and, and see whether I had in, involvement in it. Um, because usually ministers decide significant appointments. Um, it, what's, you, you've suggested that actually Jeremy Haywood um, unilaterally brought in um, 
Um, uh, well, I, I must be careful. I didn't. I mean, I I don't know, and I'm sure Nigel Ball will get to the bottom of it. I think it was Jeremy's initiative, but in terms of how Lex Greensills, um, uh, you know, contract was dealt with and his reporting lines and all of that, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, did he have um, a contract? Did he have a contract? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that. But, um, but were you ever but asked to approve him? Were you ever, ever well, asked to... Nigel Morgan will get to the bottom of that, but it's... it's were you ever more... asked to approve his appointment? I don't recall. Um, I, I, I don't recall that. Um, so there, there could be... Well has been. There could I mean, be... as Prime Minister, you have so many, yep. you know, things coming through your box that you, you approve, but are basically things that have already been sort of well teed up and, and, and organised. So I have to, I mean, I, I think the, the Nigel Borman inquiry will really help because he has the full access to the cabinet papers. And, and, I haven't and were you at any stage aware of um, officials or Crown representatives being employed by businesses they were contracting with or other bit that they were um, double hatting jobs? Were, was that... Were you ever aware of anything like that? I wasn't aware of that. What would have been your reaction had you heard about it? Well, I think the principle, um, let's leave aside the crown representatives for a second, the principle that if you work in the civil service um, and are paid by the civil service, then, you know, there really needs to be a very good justification for any other commercial role. That's the sort of principle. Of course, you've got people who are perhaps on the board of a charity or have um, uh, you know, some other job, but a sort of full-time commercial job. The principle is that that would be very unusual. I mean, you at one stage, at one stage. A, of, a way of managing interest, because obviously you will have civil servants who, who might you know, own a property they rent out or have shares in a business or what have you. There's a, you have to have a way of managing um, interest as well as that. But, I mean, at one stage, uh, John Manzoni looked as though he was going to hang on to a commercial role with um, uh, a private company. And in the end, I think he persuaded himself that it was untenable, even though he'd been given permission to do it. Did you give him permission to stay on the board of SAB Miller? Or did that come, did the come in front of Again, I, I, I would have to go back and look at any yeah. paperwork. I don't recall that. But you can um, see that, you can see that if these... Um, arrangements give rise to concern about conflicts of interest, they undermine confidence, public confidence in what the government's doing, however good the government's work is. You can see no, that, I can't agree. you? I think yeah. you've got to have a transparent system for dealing with this, um, a clear set of rules, a clear set of procedures, um, and uh, I think that is absolutely right. I mean, I, I go back to my point, you, you know, we've got to try and keep um, fluidity between public and private sectors, and also I would just make this point perhaps today of all days, you know, in a crisis, bringing people in from the private to the public sector to help with projects, you know, I, I feel extremely sorry for some people who came into government, worked extremely hard to source PPE or other equipment for the health service um, at a time of national emergency when we were running out of surgical gowns and all the rest of it and are now getting actually all over the coals. I, I do think we've got to make sure you can have some exceptional procedures for exceptional times. Yeah, but um, what, what was happening with Crown representatives between 2010 and 2015, we weren't in a crisis, so um, I accept the point you're making. That's it. I'm, I'm very happy to go away and mm. look at that and how but, the policy uh, came about and what role I played in it. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there, thank you very much. Uh, over to Sean Bailey MP. Mr Bailey, over to you. Um, thank you, Chair, Mr Cameron. I'm, I'm slightly afraid I might get the same answer, but when it comes to the formulation of the policy around crime representatives, can you recollect what conversations you had around assurance processes, particularly with regards to individuals that were taking up those roles? What was the trade-off between a good news story for value for money and robust assurance processes on appointments? I'm really sorry. I can't give you a better answer. I just don't recall. Um, I'll have to go away and, and look and see... Um, what the consultation was at the time. The principle was, let's get good people in to help with procurement. The, the cap, you know, all, all my experience at the cabinet office was that the ethics and propriety team, I think ran by Sue Gray in those days, was very rigorous. But I can't answer your question better than that. I'm very sorry about that. 
Okay, I mean, we have seen, I mean, for example, in 2019 alone, I mean, we, we can call out three examples of where that assurance process has obviously had to be beefed up. So, okay, you can't necessarily recollect from that, but maybe speaking anecdotally, could you accept perhaps that maybe there were gaps at the time that subsequently have had to be filled on this? Um, whenever you try to involve private sector skills in the public sector and those people um, are maintaining a private sector role, there's always going to be difficulties. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the non-executive directors who are helping steer our departments and give advice to ministers. Um, and of course, they're unpaid, but they are nonetheless working with those departments. And you know, you're always going to get questions asked about potential conflicts and all the rest of it. I think it'd be very sad if we were to lose their expertise. So let's try and find a way of managing any potential conflicts rather than what we don't want is a sort of Berlin Wall between public and private sectors. Okay, so for you, Mr. Cameron, where does that where does that line draw then in terms of, as you say, not excluding that skill set, but ensuring that there's that privacy there, there's that sort of transparency that's that's available to the public? Well, transparency is the key, both in if, if you have a non-executive director who has business interests coming in to help a government department, you need to know what those business interests are. Um, if you're a civil servant um, that doesn't have a second job, but does have some business interests or shareholding or whatever, you need to deal with that. I, I, I think your inquiry is very important. I, I, all I would say is the time I spend in office you know, the Civil Service Code, the Special Advisors Code, the Ministerial Code, the Ministerial Declarations, all of those things got beefed up. Um, and I was comparing the 2007 Ministerial Code with the 2010 Ministerial Code before going in front of the Select Committee. And yes, you know, it's, it's quite an impressive set of changes. So don't let's pretend that nothing's been done on this, but obviously there's more transparency and more good rulemaking that can be perhaps put in place. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Cameron, can I just ask as well, just with where does the balance lie between if good, strong relationships between Crown representatives and organisations and preferential treatment? Because we have heard in the past there's been this fear that perhaps Crown reps, has, uh, for whatever reason, through the relationships they develop, end up developing on this preferential sort of treatment basis. So I'm just curious to understand from your perspective, you know, where, where do you find that balance? I think it's a very difficult question. My, my... When we were in opposition looking at what we were going to try and do in government to make procurement better, I think one of the things, conclusions we came to is you need to break up some of these big contracts. You need much more transparency about government spending. And I think we introduced a rule of everything over £25,000 had to be um, declared for new spending. And, and the point I make is, of course, any new system you put in place with new people with outside expertise might have some risks, but there was an existing risk that those civil servants responsible for procurement could be captured in some way by the people they were procuring from. So it's not a, a new problem. Okay, um, and, and finally, Chair, um, Mr Cameron, hindsight being the wonderful thing that it is, would you say perhaps in the development of this policy it might have been helpful for you to be slightly more over the detail than you were? Uh, what? I'm sure I was more involved in the detail at the time, but it's now some time ago. And um, uh, as I say, I'll go back and look um, and see what I uh, did. But it is difficult. I wrote my memoirs. You go back and you look at the big policy areas and what okay. your information was, what your advice was, what your decision was, and you can relook at it all over again. Um, I haven't with this one, and you know, yep. perhaps this gives me an opportunity to do that. Well, I think, I think, Mr. Cameron, when our sister committee, uh, the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, sees you, I'm sure they'll give you notice of some of their areas of questioning, and you may have time to go back and look at your government papers, which, from some of your answers today, might be quite helpful. That would. Be. Yeah. Um, so uh, we will we will suggest that to our sister committee, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. So talking about detail, Mr. Cameron, you were trying to sell a company. It was trying to get a treasury facility, a CCF facility of five hundred million pounds. You were trying to get a sea bills loan guarantee of two hundred million pounds. So the taxpayer was in hot potentially for a very large amount of money. I think it's reasonable that the public should know what precisely you knew about the company. Now you said in answer many answers to the Treasury Select Committee, you weren't on the 
uh, audit committee, you weren't on the credit committee, but surely you must have asked some questions about who the company's clients were and what amount of money they were being lent. And therefore, you must have had some fairly good idea of the finances of the company and whether it was sound or not. Please, could you tell us what you do? Now, of course, I uh, knew about the finances of uh, Greensill Capital. Um, I could see the growth in the business. I could see um, the cash flows and the profits and, and, and those things. And also, when it came to the customers, I was obviously aware of who our major customers were. And when it comes to the CCFF, really, what we were trying to do, particularly as we refined the approach, was to say those big UK corporates that wanted to um, uh, pay their suppliers early and use supply chain finance commercial paper to fund that uh, would be the beneficiary. So it was companies like, for instance, uh, Vodafone. Um, so I was aware of who the customers were and aware of what we were trying to achieve. And I thought it was um, a positive idea for getting money into UK supply chains. With the C bills, um, as I explained to the Treasury Committee, I was not involved at all in Greensill's process of getting accredited by the British Business Bank, so I was less aware of that uh, policy. And as, of course, as I wasn't, you know, on the Credit Committee making credit decisions. Um, I, I had a limited involvement in, in that. I hope that answers your question. Well, I think the last part of that answer, we know from uh, Sir T Tom's evidence to us that you were, you told Sir Tom, in fact, because we got the transcript, that you had, the company had applied for CC Bill's loan. So you were aware of it, and presumably you were lobbying for that CC Bill's loan or no, guarantee. No, it, was, it was a two-stage process. I was not involved in the a credit in the process by which Greensill no, no, became no. accredited for the no, no. Lender. That was with the British Business Bank. I wasn't involved in that. I did have a brief involvement of when Greensill was saying to both the British Business Bank and the Treasury that we'd like to be engaged at the higher level so we can do more to help uh, those uh, companies requiring credit. I was briefly involved in that, just to be clear. Right. Now, I want you to be very precise in the answer to this question. You told the Treasury Select Committee earlier that you talked to Lex Greenhill at least once a week. You've told me just now that you were more aware of the finances of the company than you've previously told any committee. At what point were you aware that Lex Greenhill's company was in financial difficulties? At precisely at what point? In December uh, 2020, there was a telephone call, I recall, between myself and Mr. Greensill where he reported back that the capital raise that was planned, which in the summer and early autumn looked like it was going extremely well, was no longer going well um, because of issues of over-concentration on one customer that were of concern to the uh, German regulator of Greensill Bank. And it was at that moment that I was told this is not only a bad development in terms of the capital raise, but this is, you know, potentially going to cause a lot of difficulties for the company. So that was really the first moment that I thought there was a serious um, threat facing the company. Obviously, like all companies, it faced... Um, uh, you answer the question, Sir Ge back to Sir Geoffrey. Sir Geoffrey. Yes. So at what point did you realise that credit insurance was a problem for the company? I... I um, I didn't see that credit insurance was a problem in the summer or the autumn. Um, I wasn't aware of that. I think I became aware of it um, much closer to the point when the credit insurance wasn't renewed. But, you, but given that the company was only using one credit insurer, BCC, during the summer, shouldn't you have been asking questions about this when the whole business model relied on credit insurance so that those firms that didn't pay out, the company would be reimbursed by the credit insurance. You should have been asking more precise questions, should you not? Well, I did ask a lot of, before I joined the company and as I got to know the company and saw the importance of insurance, I did ask questions about it. My understanding that there was, uh, and I think I met with Marshall McLennan, uh, the insurance broker, 
Uh, my understanding that there was some 28 companies involved in insurance. And as I say, I wasn't aware in the summer or autumn of 2020 that the insurance issue was a, a, a looming problem. I became aware of it later. So, you, when did you actually become aware that credit insurance was a problem? Well, I, I don't have a, a sort of date I can put on that. I'd have to go away and check my records. But my memory, just sort of you know, trying to give you the big picture, is that you know, credit conditions eased in the economy, even despite of COVID. And Greensill, as far as I could see from the reports I was getting and the weekly podcast I listened into, was having a relatively successful 2021. It extended as much okay. credit in 2021 as it, sorry, in 2020 as it did in 2019. It was winning new clients. Um, it was heading for a successful capital raise. Um, you know, it would have been a tricky year because of COVID, but this was looking Confident. successful. And I don't remember uh, feeling a concern about any particular large problem until that moment in December. And I think I learned about the credit insurance problems later. But I, I, I don't want to give a misleading answer by getting something wrong. You know, one's memory okay. doesn't okay. always get things straight. But that's my memory of... Okay, you know, so, so will, then, will you come back to us? Will you, will you look into this, Mr. Cameron? And will you, this is an absolutely key question in raising capital or anything else. When you knew that credit insurance was a problem, will you, will you look into that and give this committee a date when you knew there was a problem? I will, I will do my best to, to do that. I can absolutely okay. yeah. tell you it wasn't it, it, at the time of, of March and April 2020 when okay. we were trying to um, access the CCFF. I think that's an important point. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. Um, Mr. Cameron, I've got some quick questions which will only hopefully require shorter answers. Can you just be clear that you've been asked by the Treasury Select Committee to disclose certain information? Have you disclosed all your contacts relating to your work at Greensill Capital uh, with government? Is everything out there now? Is that, that it? I, disclosed, I basically answered the Treasury yeah. letter. In, in well, okay, that's, so that's exactly my question. You asked, answered what the Treasury asked. Is there anything more? That you've got that, that you any other contacts you had with government, other than I'd what you've disclosed to, the Treasury so Secretary. I'd go away and check, but I, I I tried to do as thorough a job as I could with the Treasury. I think I actually answered gave gave them right. more in terms of disclosure. Right. Okay. Well, because they asked specific questions, I just so okay. So uh, it, it, there may be other contacts you had with government that you haven't released to the Treasury Select Committee. That's just just yes or no, really. Um, well, I have to go in. Okay, okay. I'm not, I'm not suggesting one thing or another. I just wanted to know the answer. Okay. On the issue of earned, um, the, uh, this is the NHS uh, sort of payday loan without interest scheme. How was it that Greensill could afford to pay NHS staff early for nothing, for no fee? Well, because it wasn't paying early. It was drawing down the money as you earned it. And I, please don't attach the word payday to it because it really wasn't. It was it, you couldn't get an advance on your salary. You could draw it down. Well, that's sorry, but that, but but that's before it's landed in people's pay packets. Sometimes before it's yes, landed well, in the department in, 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 in the hospital's accounts. I was wildly yeah. enthusiastic about this idea. And now, in terms of how it was going to be provided free, it was going to be a cost to Greensill. Um, yes. Okay. Exactly. Right. So that's my point. So it was a cost to Greensill, and yes. the NHS employs. Either I can never remember if it's the Red Army or the NHS that's the biggest employer in the world, but it's a pretty big employer in the world. How was it that Greensill could afford to do this at a cost to Greensill and not uh, charge charge for it? Because the cost was relatively low. Because of course, what Greensill and technology partners do is operate within the ERP of a company or an organization yeah. and pay their suppliers early so it's relatively straightforward to switch that into paying employees early and uh, of course you can finance this as an extraordinarily low cost of capital because of course the NHS is going to go on paying its staff so there's very little risk to be taken here so I, I again okay. I mustn't answer for the company because I was an advisor I'm not a direct I wasn't a director of the company but I think they would be able to explain to you why it would be relatively expensive. But let's be clear, this was, Greensill described it to me as, you know, the company's corporate social responsibility program. 
in that this was, and, and we'd had a conversation about this. I okay. remember saying to okay. me, when you, yeah, anyway, sorry, I'll, I'm going on. Yeah, I think I think I just I'm um, well. I mean, this is an area we will um, be again looking at more once the National Audit Office has been involved uh, further as well. Can I um, just be clear though, in in terms of your connections with Mr. Bill Crothers, um, were you aware that he had uh, taken on a role with Greensill while you were still Prime Minister and he was in office? No, I don't believe I was. Were you surprised? And did you have any contact with Mr Crothers prior to joining Greensill? Did he speak to you about joining Greensill Capital as no, well as Mr Greensill himself? I, I, met Mr. I met Bill Crothers when I was Prime Minister yep. and he was working in yep. government, uh, but at no stage did I talk to him about Greensill at that time. At that time? What about when, just but when you were joining Greensill? Did you have any contact with Mr Crothers to talk about I, Greensill? When I left... Um, office and then joined Greensill in August 2018, um, I would have had contact with him around but, then. I but think. after you joined or before? Um, I might have to get back to you. Okay, because Mr Greensill approached you about joining. Did Mr Crothers approach you about joining at all as well? I don't think he did. Okay. But so I, mean, I, would, I don't want to say anything in anger. I'll double check that. But, but okay. when did Mr Crothers join Greensill? Um, in 2015. Right. Um, well, I would have obviously met him, if not before, shortly after joining. But I, to be clear, when I was in government... OK. I, I, I mean, the question really is whether you, you, Mr Greensill approached you about joining. I wondered if Mr Crothers had approached you about joining Greensill Capital. But you're saying you I can't remember. I but. don't think so. But, I mean, just to be clear, I think that you know, okay. when I was Prime Minister, I didn't know that... Mr. Crothers was no, no, I'm not. Uh, no, okay, well, you've, you've said that. And just, when yeah. I was at Greensill, I didn't know Mr. Crothers had stayed on at the government. Right. Well, so. okay. Uh, we'll we'll come back to that. If need, uh, I think our sister committee may do. Craig McKinley, MP. Brief question, please. Yes, very briefly, Mr. Cameron. Um, when you were doing your own due diligence on on this company, you, you said to Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown that you were uh, involved with some of the, you know, you're looking at the finances on a regular basis. Did it not seem an oddball type of whiz-bang scheme to be offering uh, sort of financing to NHS employees for free, uh, given that there are going to be a vast number of transactions, banking costs, potential for debt write-offs when people you know, just can't be recovered, and debt recovery procedures? This, I know you said it's social responsibility, but... I mean, I haven't looked at this in great detail, but to me, it, it, it's sort of too good to be true. When things are uh, described in that way, they generally are. I mean, I wouldn't have touched this with a barge pole, okay. personally. Um, or, or were they trying to just make themselves look very big with a five-star client so they could collateralise yep. a new type of, Mr. of debt to sell to the market and, and just make themselves bigger? Mr I, Cameron. I've got concerns about that aspect of their Mr. business. Mr Cameron. First of all... Um, when I joined Greensill, um, earned wasn't even thought about. So I did due diligence on Greensill before 2018. I joined, earned um, really came about um, out of a sort of sense that if you pay suppliers early, why not pay employees early? And as I said, Greensill was able to do it at a very low cost um, because accessing the capital markets and accessing companies' ERPs is what they did. And the sense I had was that Mr. Greensill's view was, instead of having some other corporate social responsibility program, giving money to the Royal Opera House or what have you, let's focus our efforts on providing this to the NHS for free. And if that costs 10 million a year or such or whatever, um, that is our give back to the UK. That was the sense I got about the social, the purpose of, of this. Obviously, um, Greensill wanted Earn to be a massive success not just in the private sector but all over the world it was seen as a you know because you've got lots of these payday apps and most of them uh, they look good but they are charging you perhaps 50p or one pound every time you access early a bit of your salary now that 50p or one pound doesn't sound that much but it is actually quite a high APR and so the beauty of Earn was to right. say we never charge the employee we might charge the employer in the private sector so I thought it was a, a very exciting prospect, but obviously with the demise of Greensill and itself has come to an end and sold, I think, to wage stream a okay. competitor. But that was the thinking. Right. Well, I think it's a, certainly an area that's going to be looked into considerably more. Sir Bernard Jenkin. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're nearly finished. Um, I just want to 
reflect on what, if we report on this matter um, as, pub, as the Public Accounts Committee, what kind of lessons should we be drawing from all this? What, what do you think you, you would advise us to uh, make as recommendations or, uh, that, that we can draw from this? And that obviously when it's not about lobbying, and we can agree that there should be better and more transparent management of conflicts of interest, but in terms of, for example, the appointment of Crown representatives, um, you know, in retrospect, well, what would you recommend I about I, that? I, I would be very nervous about making recommendations to you. I think the, the I would almost put it the other way around and say, look, clearly there's always work to be done on managing conflicts, on transparency, on rules for the jobs people do when they leave office on how you manage inflow and outflow from the civil service to the private sector. Of course, that needs to be properly done, but, but in what you do, don't lose the ability to access private sector skills, don't lose dialogue between public and private sectors. And on this issue we've just been talking about, but it applies, I suppose, a little bit to the NHS pharmacy scheme. You know, there is an immense potential for technology to improve the way we are paid, or the way we live, or the way we work, and all the rest. I of it. understand and all that, but can it I? Be a sh you know, so so. You know, yeah. Okay. I think you have to leave room for innovation. Yes, of course we do. Um, but um, I mean, there are echoes of the Carillion collapse in all this. Mm. In that, um, yeah, exactly. what we found in that was that the government was um, the system, the government system, and the government culture was blind to. Um, certain aspects of the risks of dealing with a company like Carillion. Uh, it looked at the accounts, but it didn't really understand the risk in the balance sheet, and here it's in the balance sheet. For example, this business about the reliance on credit insurance in the rather complicated financial model adopted by Greensill. How many people do you think in the government really understood the extent of the reliance on credit insurance and what a vulnerability to the business that that was? Well, I think the answer, I mean, I don't know the direct answer to the question how many people knew, but it underlines the need for financial expertise in government. Absolutely. And that financial expertise is, some of it is probably going to have to come from the private sector. So, okay. um, you know, that, you know, I think if you, there are quite a lot of senior civil servants um, in the Treasury who've gone out and done great work in the private sector, and what they bring back in, I think, is immensely valuable. Okay. But I mean, if Cheryl Gillan was here, bless her, uh, she would be asking about um, how risk was understood and okay. uh, where risk where, where risk lay, because very often government has contracted things out thinking they contract out risk, but they're actually carrying a lot of risk or indeed importing a lot of risk. That was a lesson of the Greensill collapse. Do you think that's possibly one of the lessons here, that there was far more risk around than we understood? Possibly, um, and that's the job of your committee to work out mm. how to put those controls in place, while at the same time not losing the ability to innovate and do things in a different way. Okay. Can I just Thank make you. ask one last question? Um, um, what do you think um, you're personally learning from this? And um, uh, I wouldn't blame you if you thought that actually you question. you might carry on learning from this experience. Um, and, and what you know? What, what would you like to like like? I mean, put something on the record for us that you'd like well, to I put think, on the record. I think, as I said, um, you know, there were extraordinary circumstances in the economy after the outbreak of COVID, and you know, I, I believe as a result it was right to pick up the phone and make some points to government because I know what it's like sitting on the other side of the fence, but. You know, as I've said, ex-Prime Ministers are different. There aren't very many of us. We have to act differently, think differently. And so uh, restricting yourself in these matters to an email or a letter um, when we're not in times of crisis would be a, a good approach. And that's a key learning. I think, obviously, you know, the decisions you make when you leave government of trying to construct a life of charitable pro bono work for causes you care about and uh, commercial organizations you're going to work with i did take care i did think very hard i did consult a lot of um uh wise and eminent people but uh great care has to be taken in these things okay 
as you said thank to you the Treasury much. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown, very quick point. Yes. Do you think, with hindsight, Mr. Cameron, you should have been asking more questions earlier on last year, and you should have known that the company was in financial trouble much earlier than December? And if you had done, would you not have lobbied on the way that you did with the Treasury? Well, certainly in March and April last year, I do not believe in any way the company was in um, serious financial difficulty, and I think I've been backed up by that, by the evidence that's been given by Mr. Greensill and um, others. You know, when asked when he thought the company was in serious financial difficulty, he said December 2020. Um, so I, I'm not sure I can be expected to know better than the person running the company when it was in financial difficulty. In terms of questions asked, and, and this is the point you know, people make, you know, there were issues about the GAM fund, and issues about the exposure to Gupta and other issues. And throughout my time working for this company, before I joined it, I asked all of those questions and sought reassurances on a number of those issues. And look, as an advisor to a company who's not uh, a board director, you do look at, does this company have a properly constituted audit committee? Does it have a properly constituted legal function? Does it have a properly okay. constituted risk committee? Who's the chairman of the um, As you said, to the Treasury Select Committee. Financial insurance. Does, yeah, but I think these are important points. So all of those questions I ask, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Mr Cameron, when you were Prime Minister and I would go to school assemblies, very often the children would say to me, what's the Prime Minister like? Uh, and I would say something, you might be surprised, reasonably positive, because these were 10 and 9 and 10-year-olds. What do you think I should say to those school children now? after your 56 texts to government and the you know, issues that have arisen over the last few months? How would you like to be remembered and described? Well, I hope people will look back at a record of, of public service uh, as an MP, as a leader of the opposition and as a Prime Minister who put together the first coalition government in 70 years. You had to deal with a very tricky economic situation, but with a government that created, I think, more jobs over six years than any government uh, before or since, and a government that made a lot of changes, such as equal marriage, that has made our country a better place. Now, of course, this has been a difficult experience explaining my involvement with this company and the decisions I took, um, but ultimately, I made a choice to join a company that I believed could be a British success story. Sadly, that has ended uh, badly. I made a choice to talk to the government about important changes we thought we could make that would benefit the country, um, and actually our system works in that the government considered them, uh, everybody yeah. knows about them because of meetings that were held that were only reported because of the changes I put in place as Prime Minister, and ultimately decided not to go ahead with them. So um, uh, I, I'm, I hope that gives you some material for talking to a School assembly. Well, thank you. So, do you regret really the last few months, given what you would like to describe as your legacy as Prime Minister? Well, obviously, it's been a difficult, I mean, never mind difficult for me. I care much more the fact that it's been difficult for people who worked very hard for Greensill, who really believed in the company, who lost their jobs and had to find other employment. And, you know, as I said to the Treasury State Committee, I'd say to you, if you work for a company that goes into administration, you know, it's a very unhappy and distressing and difficult experience and you look back at the choices you made and you think what you could have done differently and there'll be lessons to learn and I'm okay. sure uh, reading your committee's report, reading the Treasury's committee report will, will help everyone concerned with those lessons. Well, can I thank you very much indeed for your time and apologies that we ran slightly longer than we expected. Order, order.